Guédelon, c'est une aventure un peu folle au cœur de la forêt bourguignonne. Depuis une vingtaine d'années, on a décidé de, de construire, pour comprendre, un château fort du XIIIe siècle. Le XIIIe siècle en France, c'est une période fabuleuse. Personne n'avait jamais construit de, dans notre monde contemporain de château du XIIIe siècle. Donc, de la première pierre à la dernière tuile, il va falloir qu'on apprenne. Nous sommes une équipe de 70 personnes, dont une quarantaine qui bâtissent ce château fort. On a annoncé 25 ans et qu'avec cette équipe, rien n'est impossible et les rêves les plus fous sont réalisables. Alors Guédelon il est différent des autres châteaux qui sont dans le monde tout simplement parce qu'il a été fabriqué au 21 e siècle avec des moyens qui eux sont médiévaux, hein, avec des techniques qui ont 800 ans. J'ai fait une dizaine d'années de, de chantier un petit peu partout en France. Alors comparer Guédelon avec ce que j'ai fait avant ça va être difficile parce que euh, Guédelon est un chantier qui est unique en fait, c'est de la science, c'est de l'archéologie et euh, ça, ça me convient bien. Quoi. C'est un retour dans l'histoire que je trouve intéressant. Chaque petite pierre a été taillée. Chaque pièce de bois a été abattue à la main, écarie à la main, euh, tracée à la main par une équipe fabuleuse. Donc ça, c'est magnifique. Et donc là, il y a une énergie incroyable que je trouve complètement émouvante. On a un vrai château en fait et c'est nous qui l'avons fabriqué. Donc moi, je suis quand même super fier de ce qu'on fait. C'est quand même une super aventure. Sword making has always been an esoteric endeavor. There's never been a great number of people doing it. You have this transformation of raw material, the alteration of nature, and in the end, you get something that just exudes power. This is Valyrian steel. It was my father's sword. The ancient swords on Game of Thrones, forged with Valyrian steel, were stronger and lighter than any other weapon. No one knows how they were made. In the real world, over a thousand years ago in Viking lands, there was also a series of special swords with mysterious origins. And a blacksmith in Wisconsin tried to make one. This is an Ulfbert sword from about 850 to maybe early 1200s. In Viking-controlled lands, you had a sword that had a name inlay called Wolfbert, which roughly translates to uh, wolf tooth or wolf bear. It's a, a word of power. There are only 350 known Ulfbert swords. Forged with a quality of steel that didn't emerge in Europe for another thousand years, no one knows exactly how they were made. I think I've come fairly close, or at least a pretty good rendition of how they made those blades. Steel is a pretty special material. We know a great deal about it, and we know almost nothing about it. So with the Ulfbert, you have a mythical steel mirrored in the Game of Thrones where you have this steel that no one's able to reproduce, that black valerian steel. Sword making technology still holds a bit of alchemy, a bit of mysticism in it. We want to believe that there's something that we can't understand. There's still mysteries in steel. I'm a fighter because that's all I've known how to be. My name is Tanya Smith and I'm a competitive historical fencer. We train in a system developed by a 14th century master and practiced until the 16th century. We've built a really awesome community of women and we're all doing it together. I train and teach in longsword, it's my primary weapon. I'm 5'2", and my longsword comes up to shoulder level. 
It's empowering and fun. You can use it to cut, you could use it to thrust, you can get close in range and grapple and really just kick ass with. Classes were very, very small in the beginning. It felt like I was the only woman. And being the token girl, it was something I was comfortable with at first, but as I got better and as I started developing my goals as a fighter, I realized I wanted to have a community of other women with shared philosophies. An event I planned was a women's tournament, one of the first of its kind in the U.S. People will view a women's event as lesser, but I shouldn't have to beat someone who's double my height or double my weight to prove that I'm a good fencer. The standard should be beating the best fighters. Women make good fighters because they want to be there. They put their heart and souls into it. You don't do this because you're forced to be there. You don't do this because there's an expectation to be there. They do it because they're passionate about it. What those characters are speaking isn't gibberish. It's actually a language called Dothraki. And it was invented by this guy, David Peterson, in lovely Orange County, California. David Peterson is what we call a conlanger, an inventor of languages. Conlanging is the intentional creation of a full language, creating its full grammar, its full phonology, its writing system if it has one, and its entire lexicon. David has written many languages, but the first one he wrote was back in 2000. I was taking an intro linguistics class at UC Berkeley in 2000, and it was just one day during class I started scribbling on my notes my very first language. He named it after his girlfriend. Meg Davy. And according to David himself? It's irredeemably awful. It's just not, it's not worth even considering anymore. Everything that I was doing with this language was just a kind of really fancy, bizarre way to speak English. So I kind of just started over and said, all right, ground zero, how do I be a language creator? Before we move forward, let's take a quick step back and talk about the godfather of modern conlanging, J.R.R. Tolkien. You probably know this name because he's the author of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. He created 14 different languages for use within Middle-earth. Quenya and Sindarin are probably his most famous. He was the very first person that we know of to create languages just for fun, and we've been kind of emulating him ever since. Now that we've cleared that up, we can move forward. We're here in California because we're curious about what it takes to create a successful language. David's having two of his friends, who are also conlangers, come over and speak with us. One of them brought ice cream. We were going to do this outside, but it's too hot, so we're going to do it inside. The three of them are talking about how languages are created, and they've come up with five steps. Take it away, guys. Oh, so, all right. A naturalistic conlang needs five basic things. One, the people. What they do, who their neighbors are, the second thing that you're going to need is a phonology or sound system. Do you have voiced and voiceless consonants? Do you have aspirated consonants? Three, words. All the nouns, all the verbs, all the modifiers. Fourth, grammar. Which is the fun part. Finally, history. You need to know how the meanings of words changed over time, and you need to know how the grammar of your language evolved from a time in the distant past to what's used now. Now that we've got that settled, let's finish this. In the past 15 years, somebody who created language went from somebody who was like, oh, you're a nerd, to, you know, oh, wow, um, that's, that's really nerdy, which now means cool. <laughs> and its prolific use in television and film proves that it's not just a passing fancy. Cool. Bye -bye.
For television, the difference between a created language and some other set prop is that the maximum level of interaction that a viewer ever has with a background set or with a prop is just seeing it on screen. A language, on the other hand, uh, when you hear it, that's the, that's the most real a language ever gets. For that reason, you have to have a fully created language for a television show and not just a bunch of gibberish. Was that good? That was great. Thank God. It's punching, it's kicking. Armored combat is sort of like uh, MMA, but with weapons. To me, this is the ultimate combat sport. My name is Andre Sanu. I'm the co-founder of the Armored Combat League. I'm the uh, captain of the national sword fighting team, the USA Knights. Our form of armored combat started a little over four years ago. It came to our ears that uh, there were some people over in Europe that were doing this and we had to build a United States team and try to be competitive with the world. Most of the arms and armor that we use comes from the late 14th and early 15th century Western Europe. Now there's some other uh, armors, but the best bang for the buck is usually late 14th century, early 15th century armor. It's kind of counterintuitive, but if you're wearing decent armor and you get hit with a sword, half the time you don't even know you've been hit. If you played football, you've done a rougher thing. It's a brawl. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You're going out there and you're brawling. Just like in rugby or football, you've got to have a plan when you go out there. The flankers end up with three people on them, and you end up with two. Now, melees are a lot more intense. Those rules are you fight until submission or until you put somebody down to the ground. There's no typical person for armored combat. You've got people from all walks of life, whether it's some sort of martial arts or football or rugby. Um, there's some history buffs too. And they'll fight and fight and fight and they'll give everything to the point of exhaustion. That's what makes a winner. It's all here. These guys will go hard at each other. They're gonna be swinging as hard as they can. They're trying to knock you down. They're trying to get you to submit. And then they're gonna help you up. They're gonna pat you on the back and they're gonna go have a steak and a beer with you.